Thank you. Hello, Will. How are you? <laughs> nice to meet you. Yeah. Dave, Thanks Dave, for having us. Right? <laughs> we have two rules of engagement up here today. No trespassing. Right. In Canada, will not hesitate to call the sheriff. They, in Canada, called me, called the sheriff, tried to get me evicted from my property one time when I called them <laughs> damaging my property. I used to take an hour and a half, maybe two hours to do the tour. I hope we can do it in an hour and maybe we won't get anybody sick. We were living the dream. It was magnificent. I mean, breathing the air here was like biting into a York peppermint patty. It was just wonderful. Um, we could smell the cedars and the pinions and and uh, it, it was just terrific. And then Encana arrived. One day after Encana arrived, <coughs> between like 5.30 in the morning and 6 o'clock in the afternoon, I counted 242 trucks went past my driveway. And there were actually many more than that during that 24 hour period because they started long before daylight and they continued way after 6 o'clock. I mean, it's 24 7, 365 when they come in. And the fracking causes a tremendous amount of fumes. How do you survive living here? Barely, just barely. But what do you do to stay away from We the... We close our house up tight, doors and windows. We can never leave doors and windows open. We have two serious problems if we do. We have this dust that is like powdered glass, and we have the fumes. And we, in, in 10 years, we have had hundreds of days that we could not go outside our house. And this stuff gets in your nose and your throat and your lungs and you just burn from the tip of your nose to the bottom of your lungs. We cough up blood and we cough up mud. You can usually smell the fumes and see the dust? Is that how you tell oh, yeah. when you can? There have been days that I could not see from my front porch to the, to the road, which is 150 feet away. Nobody's monitored the air? Nobody's even tried? <laughs> Aaron? Um, <laughs> we did an air quality test yep. a few months ago. Aaron, Aaron Newton did the test. I used to work out here, so I know that, you know, there's presence of chemicals, harmful chemicals in the air. So what'd you find, Aaron? Um, elevated levels of volatile organic compounds and presence of, well, we didn't find, we didn't show any presence of hydrogen sulfide gas at Thomas Thompson's property, uh -huh. but we did find uh, hydrogen sulfide gas present in the air of Divide Creek and Mam Creek. Um, and the, we did a baseline test in Glenwood Springs and showed virtually no uh, volatile organic compounds in the air and we measured 40 times the amount here just at Thomas Thompson's and uh, 70 to 80 times higher than, uh, than what our baseline showed up Divide Creek and uh, Mam Creek. <laughs> so it's inconvenient, it's dirty, it's noisy, it's invasive. Uh, it is also a revenue source, it's also a job source. It is also, uh, again, assisting in the national energy policy as well. How is your water? Uh, we have to buy water from town. Uh, we drilled the well and we were about to start using the water when a water well was exploded right over there gas wells farther away from that water well blew up that water well. I mean it, yeah, oh yeah, had wonderful water which is almost very unusual up here. Uh, so that got poisoned and we had gas wells closer to us than the one that caused that. So we never used it. I'm not a gambler. What do you mean blew it up? I mean it was like somebody dropped a stick of dynamite in it, blew the pump out of the ground, exploded the well and permanently forever poisoned it. This was an Encana remote fracking compound. There would be uh, a fleet of maybe 20 beautiful high-tech purple trucks from Bayou fracking in Louisiana somewhere. Also, there would be uh, a couple of big flatbed, long flatbed trucks with big bags of sand. Uh, there were uh, convoys of water tankers, um, and then the, uh, the scary part were the uh, bobtail trucks, these open back bobtail trucks that had hundreds and hundreds of 80 or 100 gallon plastic drums of hazardous liquids in there. Every drum that I saw on the backs of those trucks had some kind of a hazardous placard on it. Poisonous, flammable, caustic, whatever and they would mix all of these chemicals, the, the liquid chemicals with the sand and the water, 
and they would mix up this wonderful slurry and then they would pump it uh, along the road uh, starting from here at this, mo uh, this remote fracking site they pumped all of these uh, all of this mixture more than three miles uphill back in the valley here when those pumps would start even with the big walls on this thing uh, we could hear those pumps crank up from a mile and a half away just like they were next door to us these things were tremendously powerful every quarter of a mile or so up the road in Canada had put up these signs this big uh, danger high pressure pipeline call this 800 number if you have a problem uh, when those pumps would start up they pulsed and those these welded steel pipelines would bounce with the pulse bounce they bounced this high uh, took them I don't know, two or three months to, to build this compound down here, but it started pumping on March the 1st. Uh, these wells that were the site where, these, uh, where this fluid is being pumped were another mile and a quarter or so behind us. Starting on March the 4th, the fumes from that hit us, and it was overpowering. I mean, night and day for six weeks. We, we could not go outside of our house. Uh, so this went on night and day, seven days a week for six weeks. With all the traffic, the uh, road base is gone, the sub-road base is gone, and we're down to three inches of just hard dirt. We're in litigation right now about getting our roads fixed. Back in 2004, there was a, a major uh, explosion basically that happened on a, on a well pad that led to cementing failure on a couple of other wells that were underway. That led to a huge fracking incident where uh, the, uh, the well actually extended far beyond uh, fracking <coughs> models and blew out and contaminated it, the shallow aquifer of West Divide Creek with benzene and toluene and xylene and all the, all the constituents that come along with raw natural gas. In fact, they estimated about 115 million cubic feet uh, went into the, uh, the, uh, the environment, both terrestrial and aquatic, and we had a major exodus of wildlife and uh, those that, that uh, died escaped and uh, you know or rather those that didn't die escaped and um, the ones that died were picked over by vultures who themselves died and so it was a horrible uh, collapse of the, of the uh, chain the web of life and basically in this area and it had only begun to recover when something similar happened again in 2008 so and uh, we now have baseline data that shows that uh, contamination is pretty significant but unfortunately that area, though it could have told a lot to the nation and a world whose attention has turned to the perils of fracking, um, that uh, that area should have been included in the EPA's 2012 fracking study, but under the advice of the Scientific Advisory Committee, it was denied. And what was their reasoning for that? They were very quiet about their reasoning, but I must only assume that it is because if the evidence is known, then action must be taken. and the industry must then, and all the politicians associated with the industry, must then acknowledge those risks and become accountable. And as we all are learning, that is something the industry and, and a number of uh, politicians don't want to have to deal with. It interferes with money making. People right across the street who own all the mineral rights in this particular area that you're standing, the savages, they are not sensitized to the dust, to the noise, or anything else. They happen to be getting royalties from it. We have had every bureaucrat I can find out here, every one, uh, and we have yet to get help from anybody. Not one bit of help. I am his representative with no authority. The state of Colorado in 1996 took the rules and regulations, said they will apply all rules, regulations, and enforcement. The Garfield County will be able to do traffic control, they'll be able to do ancillary buildings, and certain pipelines of certain sizes. If there's anything with on the, uh, the pad or the development, it is the state of Colorado, the Bureau of Natural Resources, Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, and the federal government. Do you have any idea what the reduction in your property value is? Has anybody tried to assess that? Uh, I'm thinking probably close to 60% so far. Really? Yeah. 60%? Yeah. Do you have any hard evidence or is it just a... Yeah. Our property appraised at uh, $508,000. After that, we built a um, uh, $40,000 workshop, and we put in, in a, a little barn, like an $11,000 barn. This uh, appraisal we got just here a couple of months ago is about 280. dollars If we had to leave, 
I doubt we could get anywhere near that. No kidding. That's yeah. Terrible. We did a study and referenced what happens to energy development uh, and the property values around them. And they do diminish at a certain point. But they also recover over so, so many years. And then they actually become more valuable based upon, again, the improvements that have been there. So is it like a gravel pit and ugly and nasty and noisy and dirty? The answer is yes, it is. Is it desirable to live right next to it? No, it's not. Is right it now. Is it unhealthy? We have what, is, not, what is your answer? Is it my, unhealthy? My answer is it's still neutral. It has not been proven that it is. It has not proven that it is not. We really don't know what we're going to do. There, there are realities we've had to accept that the gas companies are here, and uh, if you ask them, they'll tell you they have more rights on our property than we do. On the access road that goes back to the back end of my property, they put up a brand new um, locked gate. Okay, this is the uh, well on my property here. Uh, the gas pumps up out of the ground there and then it goes under underground here in a pipe, goes to this little monitoring shed. The data that that monitoring equipment gathers is electronically transferred to the office. That's the wellhead right there. That's, that's the wellhead. Well that's the separator, and that you know, catches your oil or your flowback slash condensate yeah. from your gas. Come on, Sarah Jean. That's it. Is you okay? In this little valley here, we have probably got 50 or more pads. I would imagine that the average is 10 wells per pad. So we, we've probably got somewhere between 300 and 500 wells in this valley, each and every one of them emitting toxins into the air every day. Our state organization here that we're supposed to ultimately turn to is the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. Uh, one of their representatives, he and I were talking about uh, uh, the big picture around here. We were talking about uh, blown up water wells and poisoned creeks and uh, herds of livestock dying and uh, uh, a guy had, an Encana guy had been killed on a rig in the, back in our valley here. Uh, we were talking about uh, pets uh, dying of cancer, uh, increasing cancer rates in children and seniors in particular. Um, we were talking about all those things and he uh, just very casually, he, he said those are acceptable losses. Better than it has been is this reduction in footprint. Mm -hmm. yeah, so are. instead of having 72 pads and 72 wells, one well per pad and all those surface disturbance, putting 72 wells on one pad has less total disturbance. The rub is, if that's your neighborhood, right. that's the it's, largest chemical industrial activity from 72 right. wells. Exactly. We have had one of our worst odor and fume experiences from a well that's more than a mile behind us here. It was overpowering. We, we have to keep our house closed up as close to airtight as we can day and night every day. Can yes, sir. Can a quick question? Uh, are you familiar with the Health Impact Assessment for Battle Mesa, Garfield County, Colorado, that study? Yep, I've read that. Okay, so that study says that people within a half a mile of uh, oil and gas drilling have uh, increased likelihood of cancer of 66%. Mm -hmm. So um, what you're saying about being a mile away, um, you know, what's the percentage at that point? Um, you know, 30 percent. We've been monitoring air quality since 2003. We have online, not one day of non-containment, one day of violation of all of the regulations from EPA to NOAA to the air quality monitoring. What EPA has, has limits on ambient air concentrations is just particulate matter. Volatile organic carbon, ozone, NOx and SOx, just five. When Lisa McKenzie and Dr. Uh, Colburn are reporting about ill health effects, they're comparing these non-methane hydrocarbons, many more than the five. So here's, he's finding 65 chemicals that aren't, that don't have any standards 
for concentrations in the ambient area. Allowing a commissioner to kind of avoid your, mm -hmm. your obvious public They're question. Our, our public question <clears throat> is, are we being made ill by this? His answer is, no. you're not violating the standard. We have taken history from every individual in three counties uh, that have had respiratory problems and put through the Sacramento Institute screening process, etc. The largest impact on health in this area is, is, is sexually transmitted diseases. Well, Judy Jordan, our oil liaison until a few years or a year, maybe two years, my memory is all screwed up, she did a bunch of monitoring wells. Isn't it sad that every single one of them showed methane and hemoglobes of methane? They in the well? Specific monitoring wells? Yes. Yeah. And all of them had not just methane, but paraffin, toluene, benzene, all of the markers for thermogenic methane. But Mr. Martin and his commission won't let anybody see that. Instead, they fired Judy Jordan. They heard this new. Colorado School of Mines professor, Dr. Jeffrey Thine, who's working with Judy Jordan, um, uh, his contribution to this was he was getting the same data from the county showing thermogenic gas still coming to the surface long after and Canada had been fined 278,000 for one of its violations in Garfield County and they plugged the well. So it was in Canada's position and the commission's position that there was no longer thermogenic gas coming to the surface after they cemented the well. <laughs> Dr. Thine had data to the contrary. <coughs> when he approached the head of his department at the School of Mines he was going to publish that this was a consequence of drilling he was denied the right to publish, lost his position and tenure at the School of Mines, went to the Laramie Energy Institute. This summer, Jeffrey Thine lost his job at the Laramie Energy Institute, simply asking a journalist question about how much water the industry uses. So Josh Fox has taken to call this whole uh, contr uh, industry control of, the, of academia, for academia. Yeah. We have enormous monies put into our academic institutions not to have this kind of study come out. We have 20 plus energy companies that are under contract with those folks to develop the, the energy mm -hmm. and, and, the, and the county does not have the authority to say no. But if it comes down to a study that says that it is poisoning the neighbors, do you think they still have the right to, to mine for their minerals? Absolutely, but they have to mitigate. Those are the, place, the, the rules and regulations. If you can mitigate those issues, no matter what you do, if you can mitigate it and, and, and uh, secure that it is still safe, you can go ahead with the process. We took air quality testing results right here at Thomas's house on his porch, you know, on the back porch right here. You know, and you can see right there that you know it, the levels are higher than where you're not drilling for oil and gas. And I honestly, you know, the day that we were here, I don't think it was even that bad. I mean, I've I worked on the pads, I've smelled, you know, what all the smells smell like, and you know, you can stand there and go, oh, there it is, just like that, and then it's gone. Depends on which way the wind is blowing. And what so, were the levels that they earned? Uh, up here, it was around four parts per million um, on his back porch here. And we, we came up here to talk to Thomas and look at his land and stuff, and we had the equipment. And I just wanted to, you know, see what was in the area and with his permission and also be able to show him so that way he knew, you know, what they were breathing and that there was indeed, you know, elevated levels of volatile organic compounds and that he's not just crazy because, you know, he thinks that he smells something or, you know, they're having some, some health effects. Health effects are different for everybody. Some people might get nosebleeds, some people might get headaches, uh, some people could throw up, some people could pass out, and some people it doesn't do anything to. And after working on the gas pads for a while, I can tell you that when, you start, when you're working on them every day, you don't get those headaches anymore. Unless it's like a really bad day and, you know, the concentration levels are high or something, you, you, you can't smell it anymore. And a lot of those chemicals are, you know, um, they're caustic, they're, they cause neurological damage, um, and they're, they're known to cause cancer, yet they, you know, John Martin just sat down there and told us all that there's never been a study that even says that there's a chemical release. And Lotus, you have the testing that was from done for the Battle of Mesa deal, and that's a test that shows that there are 
harmful levels of chemicals in the air. And CU's done studies. You know, there are studies that exist. I've had COGC there to the point where they get sick. I keep them on one pad for two, three hours at a time until both of them are puking ass sick when they leave. And they tell me they're going to get my air tested, right? Now this was May of last year, 2011, when I got them sick. Finally, two months ago, five guys showed up to my house to test my air. Yeah, you know what equipment they brought? Yeah, they were five certified noses when, from the CDPHE. Rod Bruski reported uh, extreme high odor coming from a drilled well about 100 yards away from his property. This is Weld County, Boulder County line. And uh, an oil and gas commission staff person showed up and sniffed the air and took a little, uh, uh, like a... Like a horn. Like, yeah, like a funnel or something. And, and her, her effort was to see if she could smell it. And that was the standard she was applying. Have you ever heard the no. commission staff just... That sounds pretty disrespectful <laughs> if you ask me. <laughs> they really just grab a hold of everything. They control the commissioners, they control the newspaper. You know, and the Post Independent used to report a lot of issues with the oil and gas industry, and they still do to a certain extent, but they they don't do it like they did, and they're not looking to go jump and you know cover stuff. I invited them to come out and actually uh, take pictures of the air quality equipment while we were taking the testing, so that they could see for themselves and have actual statistics right there for the newspaper and Heather McGregor refused to send out a reporter. Here comes uh, Joe Haney, the uh, in Canada uh, land guy around here. He didn't call before he came, he just pulls out in front of the carport over there and I, the dogs let me know he's here. So I go down and I'm talking to him and he, he politely tells me that uh, Mr. Thompson in Canada has decided to uh, increase the size of that pad back there by about double its size and we're gonna drill some more wells on there. Uh, and we're going to pay you $20,000 to do that. Well, I think about it a minute and I say, nope, that's not going to happen. That would not begin to cover all of the aggravation and the dust and the fumes and everything that's going to happen for years when you're doing that. Mm -hmm. We're going to have more wells, more fumes right, right here. It, it's just not going to happen. Well, well, we talk some more and he gets huffier and huffier about this, you know, and uh, uh, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I'm going to tell you real words. Uh, uh, Joe Haney comes over to me and, and I call it invading my space. He was this far from me. And he leans into me and he says, you know, Mr. Thompson, we don't have to pay you a goddamn thing. We'll go back there and we'll do whatever the fuck we want to do. I suggested that he needed to leave pretty quick. <laughs> so he walks over toward his truck and he says, you know, maybe what we'll do is we'll, we'll cut in a big pad and an access road and we'll put it on that ridge up there where you can see it every day for the rest of your life. You go out on my front porch and you'll see it. It's up there. You said earlier that they, uh, in Canada, employs certain techniques and you referred to one as gorillas. Yeah. Is that? Uh, in Canada has a, uh, actually a five step uh, response program uh, for any kind of issues up here. Number one, they ignore you as long as they can. Number two, they lie to you as long as they can. Number three, they send out the charismatic. Here, her name is Cher Long. Very nice little blonde lady. Number four, they send out the gorillas and they start intimidating and, and threatening. Number five is refer to step number one. That's the way they do it to everybody and they depend on people putting, the, putting up with that. It takes years to go through this. What kinds of things would you tell them in making wise decisions because about this issue? I would have them look into cancer rates and sickness, you know, health of people who live in and around gas wells. No other part of the bureaucracy is going to protect you. They're not going to. Not the COGCC. Not anybody, not the well EPA, said. not anybody. They are not going to protect you. Write your own rules or you're going to get screwed. You're going to get screwed anyway. These people are powerful. Um, and they, they will demonstrate that to you uh, every day. You can pretty much say I got contaminated as soon as they started drilling. 
I mean, they started on me back originally at Snyder Oil, then went Ballard, then AEC, then Encana. But when they started back in 95, they drilled well just east of me, and then 97, they drilled the first four wells on my property. First thing I asked them is, where's the emission controls on them wells? There's no emission controls. Those emission controls have been required, I thought, since the late 70s. I worked the oil field back in the 70s and 80s. They started evapping on me, okay? Now, when I say evapping on me, they had an evap pit at the end of my driveway. Okay, they had another one a half mile east of that, another one half mile west, but a quarter mile south closer to my house. Now, they evapped off these pits. First off, the first six, seven months, they didn't have any containment around them at all. They're evapping 30, 40 feet in the air. <laughs> you know, then when they do put containment on it, they put it on two sides. They put it on the north and the west. Nothing on the east and the south. So I'm catching fumes 24-7 for three years. For three years, because this happened from late 2003 till 2005, November 2005. Every morning, I'm standing at my gate in a cloud of this crap, and I'm breathing it. All my livestock's breathing it. Okay, 2004, my whole body shut down. I couldn't reach my face to eat. I couldn't walk. I couldn't do nothing. I was done. I thought I was a dead man. Imagine every muscle in your body contracted at the same time. Okay? Say your bicep's pulling up on your arm, your tricep's pulling down. Now what if it's stuck halfway? But this don't go away. This don't go away for days, for weeks. Now you start swelling. When your hand is as big as a baseball and your fingers are touching each other but they're that far apart and you can't move them and you don't know if it's the skin swelling or the muscles or the bones and your whole body is doing this off and on it's traveling all over you what are you supposed to think you know okay now first my horses started aborting in 97 goats i started having one or two stillbirths a year i, I raised goats too then it, it got to the point in 2000 Three, late 2003 and 2004 were two out of three kids would be born dead. The ones that did live would end up with a, some kind of a cancer, a growth on their lymph nodes, and they'd abscess and die. The does that lived, they'd end up with either a cancer in their udder or a cancer in their uterus. Okay, I, I buried my last goat this last spring now. I, I was really scared the spring before. She had four kids, two of them dead. Now, the year before that, she had three all dead. Her sister had four that were dead, and 12 hours later, the sister died, too. Of course, she had a mass in her left udder for a year as big as two fists. Okay, her sister had one for the last year and a half in her right udder as big as two fists. When she kid last year, year no, not this spring, but the spring before, say spring 2011, she had three kids. One was born dead. The next one was born with half-inch long horns. The day it dropped out of the womb, its horns were half-inch long. It's a little doe, okay, a little white doe. The other kid was a billy goat, a little black and white billy goat, kind of small. They lived. One died. Okay, now, I thought it was pretty odd the horn, goat had horns a half-inch long. Okay, then at two and a half months, it turned into a billy goat. Yeah, you want to get scared? When you're doe... You suddenly look between its legs and it's got a set of gonads down there. You're going, oh my God. Now this goat is 20 months old. Its horns, and I'm not, I'm not kidding you, are this wide. They're like a longhorn steer. They're not like a goat. Okay, it, I call it. It's not she, it's not he, it's an it. Its horns are that wide. They're huge as far as the size of them. I've got eight-year-old goats that don't have horns that big. First thing she had was a handful of bones. There was no meat, there was no tissue, there was no sinew, there was nothing. Just kind of a pinkish purple handful of bones. That isn't birth. What's going on? Next one she had is mummified. Only half the internal organs are in it, shriveled up like a prune. The third one, I wasn't going to open it up, I was done with that, because in between the second and third one, she had another handful of damn bones. When she had the third one, I never thought a goat had that much blood in it in my life. My neighbor at the end of the road, he moved when he had a big tumor taken off his neck back in 2004, 2005. Neil Wagstrom, he's a uh, Glenwood City Police officer. Mm -hmm. Now, the last guy that lived in his house, Steve, and I don't know his last name, 
first two weeks he was there, he asked me what the hell was going on with his legs. He had the frack rash. I said, oh, don't worry about that. It'll go away eventually. He says, what do you mean? I said, well, eventually you end up with alligator hide. You don't have the rash anymore. You just have alligator hide, but don't touch it. Okay, I'm serious. You don't touch it. It itches like hell all the time. Don't touch it. If you don't touch it, you'll be back with the frack rash. If you leave it alone, you just have the alligator hide. And it looks nasty, it feels nasty, but you don't notice the feel because you don't touch it, okay? Uh, the worst place I know for frack rash is Dry Hollow up Chipperfield Lane. I mean, all you got to do is go up there in a short sleeve shirt and shorts, and you're there an hour, hour and a half, Milton, and you've got the frack rash. That's pretty, pretty bad up there for sure. Because that's where Barrett has supposedly, supposedly, the only frack water recycling facility in the area. That's all bullshit. You don't recycle it. They just store it. Okay, but, it, but it's vented. It's, there's no burners on it, but it's vented. Okay, so everybody's getting the fumes. It's lovely. It's a lovely area. Just love to retire there. <laughs> Welcome to the Industrial Waste Zone. Oh, by the way, coming to a neighborhood near you. <laughs> Be ready. <laughs> Once they move in on you, you're done. You know? Your property's done, your livestock's done, you're done. And you can never get out. I mean, you can get out. If you have the money to get out, you should leave. And leave as fast as you can. Forget about anything you got here because it's done. And, and you'll never be able to sell it because back, oh, was it a year and a half ago, Citibank, Wells Fargo, and Bank of America put out an in-state memo. No mortgages where there's gas development. None. The other thing you got to watch is when you go to any meeting that involves the oil company, especially county, city stuff, okay, all your counties and cities and states, they all put pitchers and glasses of water out there for everybody talking, right? You ever notice that all oil fields brings their own bottled water and they're all drinking the same bottled water? <laughs> Have you ever noticed that the oil field has a shopping cart plum full of Walmart with bottled freaking water? Think about it, folks. They won't drink the water because they know who's been pissing in it. Listen now, the chemical testing was done in the 40s. Back then they said it was formation liquids is what they called it. Testing was done and they enacted 18, 13, 120. All liquid, which remains liquid at surface temperatures from gas well and casing head production is drip gasoline. Okay, nowhere does it call it produced water. Then it refers you to Title 42 of the United States Code and then it also refers you to 18, 13, 112 hazardous waste. Now hazardous waste in Colorado is any substance or any material which has substances in it or related to it which cause detrimental, permanent detrimental harm, temporary detrimental harm, or cancers in any way is considered a hazardous waste in Colorado. But, like John Martin says, he wants, let the feds regulate that. Okay? The state will regulate it, but they won't follow their state law, just COGC rules. <laughs> state law was enacted back then, was enacted 1813-120 was enacted 1952, for God's sakes. We knew then that it was drip gasoline, not water. But now COGA gives a lot of cash to all your legislators. So, hey, man, and evidently it gets cleared down to the state patrol because they want to test every freaking truck. There's a simple test, like I told him, light a damn match. Test over. When that truck driver and the trooper blow the hell up, I guess you proved it ain't exactly water, is it? It's injection wells, it's land farming, it's discharges directly into the surface water. It's like, they can do whatever they want, and the EPA allows it. You mean in this area? Yes. yes. Well, and a lot of times, the help, the hired help, never says anything about it. Is it land farming, okay. though? In, in 2005, <laughs> I had a frack spill on my property. 450 barrels of frack water dumped on the ground. Because they'd been filling, they had 30 tanks sitting there. They were filling up frack battery, getting ready to frack, okay? Water haulers hauling in. All the tanks were manifolded together. So filling at one point, you fill all the tanks. My lower reservoir was filled up. Time to start irrigating the lower 20. You know, early spring, you don't have to break the dike. So I went down to open that valve, which is just below that pad. I have to go through that pad to get there. On my way there, there's a big black stain on the ground and all this liquid coming out of the back of this tank. I go over, I tell the hand, he runs over, shuts the valve off the drain valve on one of those frack tanks had been open the whole time they'd been filling. Now, the water hauler is not going to say anything because he gets paid by the barrel. He don't care how much of it dumps on the ground. It ain't his ground. He gets paid by the barrel. Whether it dumps or not, he still gets paid to fill them tanks up. 
So they bring in their supposed environmental company, which that's a joke, and, and, and they claim in, in, the, in the COGC report, the spill report, they claim they picked up 120 barrels of liquid and soil and grass, supposedly. I was there through the whole thing. First thing, they come up with a little 500-gallon ditch witch, hydroback, and I told the guy running at Greg Baines, I said, yeah, that ain't going to cut it, buddy. <laughs> you ain't going to pull none of it. So pretty soon they got two hydrovacs sitting there, okay? But a hydrovac basically a, a tanker with a hydrovac on it. He might be able to haul 60 barrels once you take off the weight for the vacuum and shit. So they got two hydrovacs there. That's the only thing. They only made one trip each truck. That's 120 barrels. Now that's what the first report done by Cordoran, the environmental company that supposedly cleaned it up, that's what their report says. But the very next page in the cleanup report is done by Encana, which says they cleaned up 300 barrels of the material. Now, first off, which page is right? <clears throat> Probably neither one. Because I asked Greg when he said they cleaned it all up and sucked up topsoil and all, I said, well, how come all the ground's still black? How come all the grass is still black? Everywhere this stuff dumped. Because like when the kid told me when he closed the valve, don't worry, sir, it's only water. I says, yeah, we got a problem around here. There's a lot of this black water that runs around. <laughs> by the way, and I always do this to him. Do you need a match? <laughs> because that shit will blow. I mean, yeah. it's, it's a mix of methanol, kerosene, and diesel with a lot of salt in it. Those yeah. salts are strychnine, mercury, magnesium, barium, and magnesium. In other words, all heavy metals. They tell you it's water. You've got these big signs on it, produced water, stenciled in black letters. But the little bitty tags, you guys been around looking at locations today. Did you look at the little signs? They tell you there's benzene, causes all kinds of nerve damage. I got benzene in my blood. Believe me, it causes a lot of nerve damage. The chemicals they don't tell you about in there is toluene, xylene, styrene, triethylmethyl benzene, and the arsenic, mercury, strychnine, magnesium, none of that. But when you ask a water hauler, when he's coming out or in your gate, what he's hauling, oh, produced water, sir. <laughs> what kind of freaking water are you, because that's what they tell the drivers. And the driver believes what he boss, his boss Black tells him. Water. A lot of them, when they, when they come to work, you know, they get the job, they're told they're hauling water. The next day, they'll see the boss and they'll say, hey, you told us we were hauling water. And he says, that's right. He says, well, it's black. What's up with that? He says, oh, there's a little carbon in it. <laughs> a, a little carbon. Yeah, hydrocarbon. I mean, years ago yeah. down in Junction, a guy took two tankers. He took his, him and his wife both hauled tankers. He took his tanker home that night full. Okay. He took it home? He took it home with a full load on it. The next morning, smart guy. His valve was froze up. Well, you know what they give you to open them valves up around here? Torch. Yeah, and then you get a weed burner. So he goes out with the weed burner. He starts thawing out his valve. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Blue chunks of that truck a quarter mile away, through Clifton Village South. Yeah. He was in the Daily Sentinel back when it happened. But you know, it's only water. New York Times did a study here. Or Expose about a year ago. This uh, Ian, what was his last name? Ian Urbina. Urbina. And the studies they did in Pennsylvania of dumping water into New York, the water contained a thousand times the limits for drinking water in nuclides. And they were just dumping it back in the river. There was no way to treat it, and they stopped it. But that's what's going on here. What they've been doing is putting these, this water in these class two wells under the supposition that it would stay down there forever. So they don't measure what they're putting in, except for TDS. What they're finding is, and what the geologists are now telling them, even the EPA scientists who permitted these wells, that all of them will leak eventually. And there's a very good chance that all this water we're injecting deep underground will somehow get back to the surface someday, at least some of it. Which, you know, and once you, I mean, if you know anything about groundwater, it is tremendously hard to clean up. Oh man! I mean, it is just—it is just forever and ever. Let me give you one example: at Rocky Mountain Arsenal, <laughs> they spent two billion dollars to clean up that site out there. They spend ten million dollars a year to keep the water, the contaminated groundwater that's in that wildlife area, from getting to the Platte River. Ten million dollars a year. You and I pay for this every year, as far as the eye can see. So everybody should be really concerned. When they say, well, we're disposing this water in these class two wells, and that's what we do on the front range. But there's a good possibility, if these geologists are right, that eventually, for our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, the groundwater, and 60% of the water is groundwater, 
will not be usable by us without tremendous cost to clean it up, if indeed we can clean it up. It's not just that contamination, because the spill ratio is un unreal. Oh, yeah, really? Yeah. <laughs> okay, two, right. two years ago, it's I'm sitting worse. at the cafe drinking my coffee like I used to do every morning, and I see a buddy of mine, I ain't seen six years, you know? And I still call him a friend because he was honest with me, okay? But the first words out of his mouth is, I won't drink any of the water around here, Rick. I said, really, Bob, what's up with that? He says, well, I'm working for Laramie, and I know what they're dumping in the creek. What? Shh. You mean midnight? I said, are you kidding me? He says, nope. I says, well, Bob, you have a good day, but I want you to know that that coffee was made with water, and that orange juice was concentrate made with water. Have a lovely day. They got a poly line, two of them running behind my house, well, just west of my property line. <laughs> And in 2004, a subcontractor came in and he put a T in one of the lines and a dump right into the creek. A piece of corrugated pipe. Attached a six inch corrugated pipe to this, you know, it's amazing what you can do with those rubber T's. And I put it on their dumps in the creek, but no valve, okay? When I asked in Canada about it, they told me that was to dump their water after it had been through their water treatment plant, which wasn't built yet. It wasn't online until November 2005. They did this in the summer 2004. They told me that was after the water went through the filter, they were allowed to dump it into the river. My question was for him, since that line comes from clear over at Knuckles Creek, so we're talking Knuckles, East Mam, Mam Creek, West Mam, and down to the Hunter Maester compressor plant is where the Harrison Western water treatment plant was, how did the water know to just keep on cruising past that T at West Mam Creek, go down to the plant, get filtered, and then come back and dump in the creek? The only economy left in Garfield County is oil and gas. Okay. It used to be that most of the towns down valley were all bedroom towns. We all worked up valley, Eagle, Vale, Aspen. Bedroom town. We did construction. We, we built the world. Okay. But there's no construction left since the recession. There's nothing. The only thing left is oil and gas. That's why Garfield County has the largest repost rate in the state. All the locals, the people, the bedroom people, the people, the construction that used to live here, they're gone, man. They left. They pulled out. They left everything they owned and got the hell out. Some of them left because even living downtown in Rifle, you're sick all the time. I mean, the outfit, I'm sure all of you seen the big flare going there in West Rifle. Yeah. Okay, that's Entercrest outfit, right? Damn, they owe the state over $800,000 right now in fines for emissions. But hey, they're all clean. You know, it's clean, cheap, natural gas. <laughs>